I'm the head of the policy. Oh, there we go. Recording is now in progress. Um, I am a uh, professor of law at uh, Griffith University, and I'm so delighted to be chairing the, the event uh, this evening uh, to discuss the 2021 update of the Tumana Oeti Moana Pacific Report at a, such a crucial time uh, in the lead up to, to COP and also with the release of the IPC, uh, IPCC report today. So it's, a, it's an absolutely crucial time. And before we start, I would like to uh, acknowledge the country where I am, which is uh, in Mianjin, Brisbane. And I would like to pay my respects to the Jagara and Turrbal people. And I want to welcome all elders who are joining us from the lands where they are. Uh, and I want to particularly extend my deepest respect to any Pacific elders joining us today. Uh, we are so privileged to have you in this conversation and we're really looking forward to sharing some insights with you. So uh, I, I really thrilled to, um, to be here and I want to now pay particular um, attention to the wonderful Karen on our screen here. So we have Auslan, Auslan interpreters for this discussion about climate justice in the Pacific because this discussion is about inclusion. So please uh, pin Karen or Cheryl to your screen and uh, uh, please um, you know, enjoy their amazingly skilled translations. All right, so first I want to introduce you to Greenpeace Australia who is hosting the event tonight. And I want to discuss, uh, or just introduce you to their mandate. I'm, I'm hoping that you all have come across uh, Greenpeace's work before. So Greenpeace Australia Pacific covers Australia, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Samoa, and 15 other island nations of the Pacific, all of whom are highly vulnerable to climate change. As an environmental campaigning organisation, Greenpeace is dedicated to securing an earth capable of nurturing life in all of its magnificent diversity. Greenpeace's history is synonymous with the Pacific's history of struggle against environmental degradation from the earliest days fighting nuclear testing in the Pacific, which was a very defining moment of my childhood, um, to the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior, and even now standing with and supporting the Pacific's fight for climate justice. So this, that's a little bit about the uh, hosts of this event. Um, now I'm going to just take you through the extraordinary panel that we have here tonight. We are very, very lucky uh, indeed to have this group with us. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Joseph Moano Kualu. And um, I've just managed to zoom my notes beautifully so that I can't see anything. So it gives me one second. Uh, there we go. That is just so much better. Um, so, Oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. Give me one second. Anyway. Uh, we are so privileged to have Joseph with us tonight uh, in the middle of a very big day for him. Joe is the Greenpeace Head of Pacific and he campaigns for climate justice on behalf of 24 Pacific Island nations and territories. Joseph was appointed by Pope Francis as an advisor to the Vatican on climate policy and has been a climate negotiations trainer for the Commonwealth Secretariat, where he has trained young people from climate vulnerable Commonwealth nations to engage in global climate change policy and negotiation spaces. Prior to working with Greenpeace, he co-founded the Pacific Climate Warriors team in Wellington and continues working with civil society groups and political networks throughout the region to strengthen the Pacific's climate objectives. Um, Joe is going to open our proceedings tonight, but first I'm just going to introduce you to the rest of the panel. We have an extraordinary group here. Uh, we have our very own Brendan Mackey, Professor Brendan Mackey, uh, who I'm uh, very grateful to work with, is the Director of the Griffith Climate Action Beacon here at Griffith University, which is a five-year multidisciplinary investment in climate action. He's the Director of our Beacon, uh, but also the Climate Change Response Program and the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility at Griffith. He has a PhD in ecology from the Australian National University. And the current focus of his work is climate change adaptation and mitigation, science-based policy for climate change, conservation and sustainable development. And as an author, um, he is going to speak tonight to the latest science about 
observed climate change impacts and projected climate risk for the Pacific. Uh, we also have the extraordinary Genevieve Jeeva, Jenny Jeeva, who is also a climate warrior, which has got to be one of the coolest titles ever. Um, Jenny's from Suva, Fiji. She's a youth advocate for stronger action on the climate crisis. She's graduated with her Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Politics and completed a postgraduate diploma in Diplomacy and International Affairs from the University of the South Pacific. She is also a volunteer member of the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, committee member of 350 Fiji and part of the Pacific Climate Warriors. And she's going to speak specifically to these climate justice issues in the region. Our third panel member is Kavita Nadu, who's a human rights lawyer and Greenpeace Australia Pacific board member. Uh, she is a uh, amazing uh, international human rights lawyer from Fiji who is specialising in climate justice, gender and security. She works with grassroots women in all their diversity from Asia and the Pacific to build a feminist climate justice movement. Currently, Kavita is working as a consultant engaged in feminist participatory action research in Fiji and Kiribati with Edith Cowan University and Plan International Australia and in the Mekong region with Oxfam Australia. She also represents the women and gender constituency at the UNFCCC. And she's going to speak particularly to the idea of radical system change, which is deeply cool. Um, we also have Dr. Nicola Kajule, who is the Head of Research and Investigations at Greenpeace Australia Pacific. Prior to joining Greenpeace, Nicola was a academic and has lectured at the University of Oxford, the ANU and Sydney University. An Australian National of Macedonian Extraction, he holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford where he was a Clarendon Scholar and also from Macquarie University. Uh, so that's his BA ONS. He's currently leading Greenpeace Australia's Pacific Research Unit, where he directs all aspects of investigation strategy, including stakeholder engagement and staff management. He is Greenpeace's lead spokesperson on priority campaigns for print, radio, and television media outlets. And uh, we do welcome any journalists uh, who are joining us this evening. And we will ask you to identify yourself when we get to that part of the Q&A. So I now would love to ask uh, Joe to kick us off. Um, I also want to um, draw your attention to the hashtags in the chat. So feel free to tweet and to keep the conversation very lively. And now I'm going to ask Joe to open our, uh, provide us with some opening remarks for the launch of this report. Thank you. Joseph? Thank you. Yeah, I was having trouble unmuting myself. <laughs> um, well, Talifa, thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time out to join us tonight. Uh, welcome, indeed, to the launch of Te Mana o Te Moana. And I uh, might I take this opportunity to thank Susan and Griffith University as well for partnering um, with us for tonight's launch. A uh, special welcome to those from farther afield and especially those uh, from around the Pacific. Uh, and for your stories of resilience, which you know, give us the strength we need to, to do the work that we do. Um, so just before I get into the genesis of the report, it's important to know that the report itself um, is not a standalone item, but part of our overall approach to gaining a better understanding of how climate change is affecting the region. Uh, and as part of our organization's efforts at a more holistic approach at campaigning uh, in the Pacific, um, the urgency, as you will see, is such that it demands a complete approach. Um, and so the report sits alongside other key areas of our Pacific work, and it forms the basis on which we build uh, all the other areas of our work in the region. Uh, so the report itself provides a look into the realities we face uh, here in the region and to the causes of the current crisis. It also gives us a clear roadmap of where we need to get to it's important uh, at the outset to note that while this report um, outlines, outlines trends and policies and data and statistics, uh, behind every number is a person and communities who are experiencing some form 
of crop damage or water and food and security. Uh, behind every extreme weather event, our entire nation, the loss of infrastructure and economic progress. And behind every graph and projection in this report, our cultures, families, um, and the way of life of millions of people that are now completely dependent on what happens next and the kind of action that we take. And so we've really sought to capture uh, the essence of that by including case studies from some of the in individuals that we met and that Jenny will go into further details on. Uh, but I wanted to preface my comments with this because, you know, when we're approaching, you know, the issue of climate change, there is a tendency to come at it from a purely intellectual level of understanding and with a degree of separation from the issues that we are discussing. And that is important, but not sufficient when trying to understand the full scale of the situation that Pacific people are uh, having to endure every day. So, you know, I'd encourage everyone joining us tonight and those who will read it uh, after tonight to really take the time to go through and to try to absorb, you know, what the Honorable Enele Sopwanga has written in his foreword, because in there, we can see what is truly at stake. Climate change is at its heart about people, uh, both people causing this and especially those of us from throughout the Pacific who must experience these things on a daily and uh, worsening basis. And for decades now, the Pacific has been calling for action and for almost the same amount of time we've had to do so while experiencing the worst of the impacts. So you can imagine the labor of having to be the moral voice and at the same time, you know, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. Um, so just a quick uh, overview uh, of the campaign itself and where the report sits within that. Um, we began a process of consultation with Pacific leaders and communities uh, way back in 2019. We sat at the feet of elders and, and really absorbed as much knowledge uh, as we could to deepen our own understanding of um, movement building and the, ro the, the role of stewardship uh, through the Pacific lens. Uh, we fostered these key relationships um, through the region. And then through this consultative um, process, it really revealed to us an important truth that being um, you know, our approach to this fight uh, needs to be with every available option at our disposal. And only a collective approach to the climate crisis can yield a collectively acceptable solution um, and the way to do that is to campaign collectively with all our regional partners through a variety of approaches and work streams, uh, all of whom work cumulatively towards the common goal of securing a safe uh, and habitable future uh, for our children. So through this process, we identified four key areas where we could support the Pacific's climate action efforts and maximize the impact of our work uh, in the region. The first key area is through political engagement and support. So Pacific leaders have been quite vocal at this level, despite all the challenges. So we've been providing support at regional and UNFCCC negotiations. It also includes our work on the climate litigation, which, you know, for obvious reasons I can't get into, um, but suffice to say that we are working with um, Pacific governments to develop legal pathways uh, towards climate justice. The second area is through our actions. So supporting our local groups, uh, building grassroots capability throughout Australia and the Pacific Islands. And obviously due to COVID, a lot of this work is being deferred, um, but it is particularly exciting uh, given the strength of our relationships with groups throughout the region, some of whom are attending uh, and have helped us with our call tonight. The third area has been really being intentional with looking at the narratives uh, that have been presented about the Pacific. Um, it's allowed us to amplify voices from the front lines, changing outdated um, and extractive narratives of the region, and really um, having our own people tell our own stories. Um, we're more than just broken seawalls and cyclones. There is much more to the region, and there is much um, to be learned from the region, and especially in this kind of uh, area of work. Um, and then finally, we come to the fourth stream, uh, which is research and investigations. We began uh, mapping out the work, and in doing so, we realized that we needed the best available information, the latest scientific data, um, an awareness of the political currents, and having all those uh, researched and collected in collaboration with our regional partners, and then presented with the relevant context in order to better inform all our work and provide a policy bedrock for our advocacy. So uh, as some of you may know tonight, the 
IPCC report is being launched and I think it's fitting that tonight we're able to give a contextual understanding of those findings uh, through the launch of Te Mana or Te Moana uh, and to the Pacific as they pertain to us. Uh, I'll just close off with the rationale behind the report. Um, the aims of the report were to demonstrate the extent of the climate crisis facing the Pacific, uh, to quantify who is most responsible and you know, we approached that through an analysis of the commitments made by the major emitters uh, in light of the Paris Agreement uh, and also looking at their progress towards them. Um, and then finally, uh, and I think for me personally, most importantly, to put a human face on the crisis. Um, this was important to us because we, you know, we've become all too accustomed to climate change being a buzzword or a political football thrown around. But, you know, for us in the Pacific, it, you know, it's, it's real, it's daily. It's, uh, it's an issue about people. So it's through the case studies that we're able to tell these stories of effective Pacific communities and foreground these communities' demands for action on climate mitigation uh, and adaptation. So that was a look at the context uh, within which the report uh, is situated. And so I just want to thank you all again for joining us tonight, uh, to our partners who have assisted us with this, uh, and most of all to the communities who were uh, very gracious uh, enough to share with us their stories and who entrusted to us this task of amplifying the challenges as well as the resilience of you know, the peoples of the Pacific. So I'll hand it back over to you, Susan. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I love a lot about that um, framework in the sense of foregrounding voices and stories and um, feeling the, the blood and heart and bone beneath the stories, the soil beneath the stories. It's um, a very important way, I think, to engage in these climate justice debates, but I would say that I'm a human rights lawyer. But there's a part in the forward where the minister says you look, you have to look in the eyes of the first child you meet after reading the report. And I, I found that, um, you know, it's confronting to really look at the eyes of children and think about what your duties and responsibilities are to that child. Um, so um, it's time to also hit us with some science though. Uh, and of course, uh, the best person in the world to do that is Professor Brendan Mackey. The IPCC report is about to go live at 6 p.m., we understand. Uh, so what an amazing opportunity to get some insight from one of the lead authors. So over to you, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Uh and good evening, everyone. Just to clarify, I'm not actually uh, author in the Working Group One report, which is being released today. I'm I'm a coordinating lead author in a chapter in Working Group Two, which is looking at impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. Uh, but let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose land I'm speaking to you from the which is the Gold Coast in Queensland, which is situated on the land of the Yungambe Kumbamberi peoples. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as to other elders from Australia and the Pacific who are in attendance today. The Greenpeace report, Tia Mana Atema Moana, the state of the climate in the Pacific 21, 2021 is to be welcomed because it fills a critical gap in in bringing a much needed focus and sharp lens to this important region, which remains, I think we could say, underserved by the international scientific community. In the current UN system, Australia and New Zealand joined the Pacific community as part of the Oceania region. This highlights the many cultural, family and economic connections we share in addition to our geography or the are related to our geography, but they also point to the special responsibilities that Australia and New Zealand have to our Pacific community for helping them achieve climate resilient, sustainable development and shouldering our fair share of the mitigation burden to achieve the deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions needed to flatten the carbon curve, if I can borrow a COVID analogy, and limit global warming to as close as possible if not below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So I'd like to very briefly speak to four issues that I hope will underpin the significance of the report being released today and, and why it addresses matters of such importance and urgency. 
The first is that the science is now clear and unequivocal. Now, make no mistake, uh, the science is absolutely unequivocal about human influence on the climate system. Uh, human influence climate change is an established scientific fact. The only uncertainty is the scientific uncertainty about the specific locations and the timing and severity of particular projected impacts. And of course, how future climate unfolds is now very dependent on the, dependent on the extent to which the world community is prepared and able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and therefore what level of global warming is reached. It's also an established scientific fact that we are now experiencing the impacts and consequences from 1.2 degrees of global warming relative to pre-industrial levels. So climate change is not something that's going to happen, it's something which has happened. People often dismiss that statistic 1.2 degrees because it doesn't sound like very much, but if you think about it, neither does an adult body's temperature reading of 38 degrees, given the range of normal temperature for an adult is 36.1 to 37.2. Yet we know a mere 38 degrees is diagnostic of a fever and a, and a simple increase of two degrees or three degrees or 40 degrees is life-threatening. So when we talk about levels of global warming above pre-industrial levels, think of it as a earth body thermometer reading. 0.1 of a degree, i.e. the difference between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees, represents about 10 years worth of global warming, which in turn indicates an incredibly significant change in Earth's planetary climatic conditions. So the fact is that the level of global warming, how many degrees and fractions of a degree, the planet warms above pre-industrial levels, is correlated in a straight line relationship with accumulated CO2 emissions, and furthermore, each fraction of a degree of global warming is also correlated with the increase in the kinds and severity of climate-related impacts, the loss and damage to human and natural systems, the amplification of existing hazards, and the bringing about of new chronic and acute risks. This is why climate science places so much emphasis on the need to limit global warming as much as possible. Every pulse, of anthropogenic CO2 emissions counts and increases the level of global warming. We can no longer hide behind the drop in the bucket argument. There is no longer any safe level of greenhouse gas emissions. The question is how much additional harm, loss and damage can now be avoided. We also now have a substantial body of what is called climate change attribution science and also climate impact attribution science. This means we can now scientifically attribute changes in extreme weather-related events such as Category 5 tropical cyclones, catastrophic wildfires, severe droughts, intense rainfall and flooding to climate change. And in fact, we can quantify how much more likely a given event was due to human influence global warming. This means we can now much better establish the chains of cause and effect between human emissions, global warming, altered climatic conditions, and the climate impact drivers causing the increasing harm, loss, and damage to human and natural systems. This attribution science provides the evidence base in support of improving the accountabilities of countries, governments, corporations for emissions and associated impacts and consequences. My third point is that I think it should also be clear to everyone now that the climate change is what game theorists call a net zero gun sum game. A net, a net, uh, sorry, a zero sum game is where there are winners and losers. For me to win, you have to lose. But in a non-zero sum game, we're, we all win or we all lose. Climate change is a non-zero sum game. This is what the science is telling us. We are all in it together. There is no safe place and we all win or we all lose. But of course, there are those such as Pacific small island developing states that are on the front line of the impacts, have been the least responsible for causing the problem, are in urgent need of substantial climate funds and technical assistance to better adapt to the impacts they are currently experiencing and to manage the projected risks which cannot be avoided. Small islands are particularly exposed and will reach the limits of adaptation sooner. And I think of particular concern for the Pacific 
is that a certain amount of additional global warming is now locked in and some impacts are therefore avoided. But I'll just mention three. You're going to hear about others tonight in more detail and the report touches upon all of them. The first is tropical coral reefs. Marine heat waves cause coral bleaching and the regeneration time for coral is around 10 years. So as we approach 1.5 degrees of global warming and we're at 1.2, the frequency of these events increases and exceeds the coral's regeneration time. Indeed, many marine scientists think we have already crossed that threshold. The second is, of course, sea level rise uh, is now locked in for a long period of time and with a range of impacts in the coastal zone, including saltwater intrusion of soil and freshwater resources, as well as the more widely known inundation and erosion. And finally, we need to be cognizant of climate change impacts on food security in the Pacific region. In addition to changes in marine food supply from the potential loss of fringing coral reefs and changes in ocean currents and the distribution of tuna and other seafood, for those islands that experience a dry season, changes in the length and severity of the dry season impacts on subsistence food production and increasing temperatures will mean some islands and landscapes will become suboptimal for growing taro and other basic crops. Ultimately, there is only one solution to the climate change problem. We need to stop using fossil fuels and rapidly transform our energy systems to be powered by clean renewable sources, mainly solar and wind, but there's also a role for appropriate hydro and tidal plus energy storage solutions. We also need to halt deforestation and degradation as these are still a major source of carbon dioxide emissions. Economically developed countries like Australia and New Zealand have obligations under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement to take the lead in doing the heavy lifting in reducing emissions and to provide the funds needed to help developing countries like Pacific SIDS leapfrog to clean energy sources and adapt to the unavoidable impacts and consequences of our rapidly changing climate. So I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. And I will now hand back to Professor Harris Rimmer. And I look forward to hearing further commentary on this important report, The State of the Climate in the Pacific 2021, from our other panelists. Thank you very much, Brendan. I love that analogy of the human thermometer and the planetary thermometer. That makes perfect sense. Um, and also that reminder that this is a non-zero sum game. So plenty, plenty in that uh, talk for us to consider. And now's the time to start thinking about your brilliant questions uh, to put in the chat to, um, to ask the panelists. Um, so now we're going to ask Nicola Kajule to take us through some of the major findings of the report. Nicola. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, and thank you, Brendan and Joe as well. Uh, there's a lot of data a lot of numbers in this report, um, and I'm going to try and present some of those, at least some of the key ones to you in a way that's relatively easy to understand. Um, I know that uh, the speakers who come after me will help to flesh out some of that uh, in, in a way that as, um, as Joe, uh, you know, rightly uh, telegraphed for us at the start that, you know, these numbers uh, represent people and cultures and livelihoods. So we should never forget that. But having said that, I'm going to uh, keep our focus on the numbers just, just for a moment. Um, allow me to share my screen. And hopefully everybody can see that as it comes up in a moment. Great, hopefully we can all see that, that's excellent. Uh, so, <clears throat> Temano or Temana by the numbers. Let's have a look at what some of the data that underpin this report and its conclusions uh, tell us. So the first number that I'm going to present to you is 72.21%. That is the annual emissions globally that is produced by the world's top 15 emitting countries. So from one to 15, starting with China and going down to Australia at number 15, when taken together, those 15 countries produce over 70% of all global emissions, or at least in 2018, which is the last year that we have a reliable comparable data for. 
And this is what some of those uh, emissions trajectories look like. So this graph goes back to 1990 and uh, ends at 2018. Uh, for those of you that are a bit more details oriented, it does include land use, land use change and forestry. Uh, I won't go into the details of that, but the reason we do that is because the IPCC includes those uh, that as a factor as well. So we've decided to follow their lead uh, and do that. And as you can see over that period, that yellow line is China. That's really the big story in global emissions trajectories from around 2000. China increasingly became the, the factory of the world and uh, a lot of that manufacturing was powered by a burning of coal and burning of fossil fuels. The next line down is the United States. Uh, and then below that, this kind of fluorescent uh, or aqua line is the European Union and then onwards down to until we have uh, that, that gray line is others. So that's numbers 11 to 15. Uh, Australia, it's a little bit hard to distinguish these lines at the bottom, but Australia is, is this black line down the bottom, averaging around between 530 and 600-ish uh, megatons of CO2 per year, or to use the same gigaton uh, element, it's, it's point, uh, you know, 0.5 to 0.6 uh, gigatons of CO2 every year. The next number I'm going to give you is 0.23%. That number is the amount of annual global emissions produced by the 14 Pacific Island countries that are signatories to the Paris Climate Agreement, just 0.23%. And so when you compare that to the 72% produced by the top 15, you really see how stark the injustice at the core of the climate crisis really is. Pacific countries that have bear almost no responsibility for the climate crisis uh, have, are bearing the, the worst impacts of it are suffering the most when the industrialized uh, powers of the world that are still producing the vast majority of global emissions uh, are much better place to uh, you know uh, cope with it. A few more numbers. 5.37%. Uh, so the next few numbers are going to be talk we're, we're going to talk about what um, the nationally determined contributions of these top 15 emitters look like. In other words, what are the climate, what are their emissions reduction targets? And what world would we get to? What warming would we get to if each of those countries' targets were extrapolated to the whole world? So if every country had that target, what warming would we get to? So the 5.37% of those top 15 emitters NDCs or climate targets would lock us into a over a four degree world. The next 33% of NDCs would lock us into a three to four degree warming world by the end of the century. The subsequent 13.2% would lock us into two to three degrees of warming, giving us a total of around two thirds of global annual emissions. So countries responsible for two thirds of global emissions every year, they, their targets, their ambition would lock us into it two degrees of warming or more. In fact, the only country that is compatible with a two degree trajectory, as you see here on this graph on the left or this table on the left, is India. Every other one of those countries ordered from the largest emitter, China, to the 15th emitter, Australia, have targets that are not compatible with a two degree world, and none of them have targets that are compatible with a 1.5 degree world, which we know is so crucial for the uh, prosperity and survival of the Pacific. This table that we look at here, this is uh, the status of new climate targets, new NDCs as submitted by those top 15 countries. So the Paris Climate Agreement came into force in 2015, and it requires countries to increase their ambition to submit stronger targets over time. And while the clock on that doesn't start until, or started in 2020, because most countries published their NDCs in 2015 and were then you know, uh, pushed to update them, Many have updated those NDCs or those climate targets by the you know, in December last year, or as part of President Biden's Climate Action Summit uh, at the start of this year. So, as you can see in that table, um, China, the US, the EU, Japan, and Canada all have either proposed or formally submitted a stronger target to the UNFCCC. Some countries have not yet updated their intentions, so India uh, and, and others. But six countries, including Australia, have submitted a target that either does not increase ambition, as in the case of Australia, or that actively decreases ambition by playing around with what the baseline emissions that they claim is, as in the case of, of Mexico, 
uh, and Brazil. So in a, in a sense, this table, why I've got the sort of hand there is who is putting their hand up to try and do more based on where they were before. And Australia has failed miserably in that regard. It, it you know, pains me to say. So where does that take us over the next uh, you know, 80 years or so? Well, this uh, climate, this thermometer, if you like, um, which is taken from Climate Action Tracker's excellent analysis uh, based on the, um, the May 21 figures, gives us a really good snapshot of what that looks like. So on current policies, that's this uh, darker blue bar in the middle. So this is ignoring the, the promises. This is just on the policies currently in place in the various countries around the world. We are looking at 2.9 degrees of, of warming and possibly up to 3.9 because these projections always give us a range of possible outcomes. When looking at the pledges and targets, so all those NDCs, those climate targets that we just spoke about, we're looking at around 2.4 degrees of warming with a potential of getting up to 3.0. So it doesn't need to be said, I don't think that that is still catastrophic for the, for the global climate and in particular for the Pacific. Um, at uh, two degrees of warming, uh, for example, 99% um, of coral cover in the world's coral, coral reefs will bleach and die. That is what the latest uh, science tells us. Um, these optimistic targets, I should say something about this, this is uh, a really pie in the sky projection here. And so we shouldn't put too much weight on that. We're much more likely to get into this territory. What these optimistic targets are is literally every single utterance from any global leader or official, including very vague net zero by 2050 or 2060 or whatever it might be, including entirely aspirational goals. If every single one of those were met in full by the deadlines that uh, were set, in other words, if the world's nations behaved in a way that is entirely uh, inconsistent with their past record, then we are we are getting to something like a two degree warming, maybe with a maximum of 2.6. So I hope that we get there, but um, at the moment, we're much more likely to be looking at somewhere in the, the mid to high two degrees or even, even higher. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much for uh, paying attention and, and for following along. I, I hope that those numbers uh, weren't too, um, too dense. Uh, and, you know, looking forward to the Q&A uh, later on in the session. Thank you so much. Uh, very sobering. Uh, and now to give us a little bit more background as to what this means for communities in the Pacific, we have Genevieve. Over to you. Thank you, Susan. Bula Vinaka and good evening, everyone. Um, while I'm speaking, you will see on screen photos and quotes from some of the incredible Pacific women that are fighting for our survival and whose case studies are included in this report. Um, next slide, please. Their stories and the resilience of Pacific communities are at the heart of this report. The region that I call home uh, includes over 8 million people, 25,000 islands, and 1,200 indigenous languages under threat from a crisis that we didn't cause. The stark reality we are facing includes a legacy of permanent losses and damages from climate impacts, including sea level rise, drought, flooding, tropical cyclones, and displacement. And these impacts not only threaten lives and livelihoods, but also history, heritage, and culture of Pacific communities. However, our story is not just of impacts, it is also of resilience. The Pacific is fighting in many ways and in many places to ensure our voices are heard and our future is secured. Next slide, please. There are two crucial strands of collective advocacy which frame the search for Pacific climate justice. And the first includes acknowledging responsibility of major polluters and continuing to hold them accountable. Major polluters must not just ensure more ambitious climate plans, but also provide continuing support, particularly finance, for those who are already experiencing impacts. The second comprises of the agency and resilience of Pacific communities in fighting for our survival. Pacific communities who are leading just and equitable climate solutions centered in traditional and indigenous knowledge that are environmentally sustainable and through global leadership, storytelling, 
campaigning and intergenerational solidarity paves the way for a habitable and sustainable future for all. We can see this through a number of amazing actions being taken. Next slide, please. Our Pacific Island leaders, for example, are showing their moral authority through ambitious climate plans and movement towards renewable energy. Moreover, in 2019, on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the Marshall Islands called for the establishment of a special repertoire on human rights and climate change. As a special repertoire could help with the climate fight by contributing towards solidifying the link between climate change and human rights in global discourse and the integration of human rights protection in climate action. Our communities are also building resilience through indigenous knowledge and science. Women leaders in Vanuatu are mobilizing, sharing their stories and taking action in their communities. Next slide, please. Our Pacific young leaders are taking on the mantle of action and advocacy. One of the ways youth are leading is through calls for greater global recognition of climate change as a human right. Through the Pacific Island students fighting climate change, there is a call that is now part of a youth-led global movement supporting um, the, an advisory opinion through the International Court of Justice. And Vanuatu is seeking to build a coalition with supporting countries for a vote on this at the UN General Assembly. This will help through building on domestic climate litigation cases and integrating human rights and environmental law, supporting more ambitious action under the Paris Agreement, cementing consensus on scientific evidence of climate change, and helping to inform international and domestic climate litigation as a way to seek climate justice. Next slide, please. In the face of all of these impacts that, are, that Pacific communities uh, are trying to address, in 2020, we also found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic, which is exacerbating climate impacts. Climate change has not stopped in the face of COVID-19. And in 2020 and 2021, much of 2021, Pacific communities have had to face a number of devastating natural disasters while following COVID safe protocols. This has added an extra burden towards rebuilding. And as the world works to recover, there is an opportunity for fundamental systematic change, which puts us on the road to a just and sustainable future. We can apply the lessons that we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic to addressing the climate crisis by directing funds towards renewable energy investment and infrastructure, prioritizing social and economic initiatives to benefit those most affected and dismantling power imbalances. In short, we must put people and communities first. We must ensure support for those who are most vulnerable and we must continue holding leaders and those responsible to account. The legacy of climate justice in the Pacific must be a future in which the Pacific Islands survive and thrive, where culture and traditions flourish and language and history is passed on to those who will come after us. Anything less is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, the, the profiles of these women uh, on Greenpeace Australia's Facebook page, uh, they're amazing. And I, I highly recommend that you all go and look up um, every single one of them. But my particular favourite was Dora. I thought she's completely awesome. All right, we're now um, moving to another climate uh, justice uh, advocate uh, in Kaveda Nadu. Please, Kaveda is going to talk to us more about this historical injustice issue. Thank you, Susan. It's always difficult being the last panel speaker. So my apologies in advance if some of my messaging is repeated, but I think it's also important to hear these messages over and over again until something happens. But first of all, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from stolen Gadigal land of Sydney and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. 
I'd like to pay tribute to the work of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, Iwi Māori and Indigenous Pacific Islanders fighting for climate justice to protect the country. My presentation is going to look at what climate injustice looks like in the Pacific and why Australia and the rich global north owe us a historical debt to address the climate crisis we're in. We in the Pacific have deliberately been made vulnerable. Our long colonial history enslaved, extracted and exploited our natural resources and labor to build the economies of Australia and the global north. To put it plainly, let's take a look at how these rich nations plundered the Pacific. In colonial times, it was whaling, logging mahogany and sandalwood, slavery, and then nuclear testing. These days, it's tuna, land and deep sea mining, and overseas seasonal worker schemes. So how it works is that we in the Pacific are commodified for rich Western nations to relentlessly pursue their neoliberal fossil fuel driven economic growth and profit. We are not responsible for causing the climate crisis. This was explicitly recognized as CBDR or common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities under the United Nations framework on climate change. What this means is that Australia and the global north have the greater onus of accelerating climate mitigation in their countries and allowing developing nations to mitigate what they can while balancing their economic development. To force developing countries to mitigate at the same level is clearly inequitable. The rich countries are avoiding their own responsibility for not only causing the crisis, but now refusing to do what it takes to address it. We have to hold Australia and the global north accountable so that we in the Pacific are able to have a fighting chance of survival. The climate crisis is not simply about building resilience or adapting. It is also about loss and damage, where it is no longer feasible to adapt. The report shares that over 9.2 million people have been affected by extreme events in the Pacific over the past 50 years, which have led to approximately 10,000 reported deaths and damages of about $3.2 billion. There is no effective redress for this staggering loss. Increasingly, coastal communities are being displaced permanently, and there is irreversible damage to our land and marine ecosystems. Climate change is directly threatening our human rights, such as the right to life, the right to live in a safe environment, the right to food and clean water, the right to secure employment, health, education, cultural heritage, and so on. The worst brunt of climate change impacts are experienced by the most marginalized and vulnerable groups, such as women and girls in, the, in all their diversity, peoples living with disability, gender non-binary, elderly, indigenous peoples, refugees, migrants, and those living under occupation. Therefore, climate justice links human rights and developments to achieve a human-centered approach safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable and sharing the burdens of climate change and its resolution equitably and fairly. But the Pacific governments are not in a position to finance, build technology or resource climate resilience, much less provide remedies for loss and damage. In an unjust international trade and investment regime, the Pacific is heavily indebted to international financial institutions that has forced them to privatize, deregulate and liberate liberalized trade. This flows into eroding environment safeguards, weakening labor rights, public services, increasing tax, and rising unemployment. In other words, and I quote Lydia Nackpill, we are incapable of generating wealth as much of our country's wealth, both natural resources, as well as wealth generated by our people, leave our countries. Therefore, this system reinforces the dominance and power of rich countries and drains the Pacific. Without radically transforming these oppressive systems that are designed to benefit the elites and lock us into catastrophic temperature rise, the fight for climate justice will fail. We have to mobilize, resist, and dismantle this system to ensure a new order that redistributes wealth and power, is gender just and equitable, sustainable, regenerative, care-based, community-owned, is grounded in indigenous and traditional knowledge and protects human rights. We have no other choice. Thank you. 
Well, that was amazing. I'm speechless. <laughs> um, it, the, the inequity of the current situation for the Pacific is so profound. I think most Australians uh, need to sit with it, you know, sit with the profundity of the current situation. So that was extraordinary. Thank you so much. We are, we are now moving to questions and there's plenty of time to explore and interrogate some of these, you know, quite difficult ideas about what next, what happens as a result of this knowledge that we have. Um, the first question is from you, Brendan. It's about the risk to the health of tropical coral reefs from uh, global warming beyond 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial pre levels. Please, Brendan. Yeah, thanks. Well, I mean, the, the science here is really clear that once uh, you start to have, well, uh, the, the, the frequency of marine heat waves, which is the main climate in, impact driver for, for coral bleaching events, um, is increasing. The frequency is increasing. And it takes about nine, a, a coral reef when it experiences a bleaching event can recover. The coral can regain the microalgae and, and can regenerate, that, that actually happens. But it takes time, it takes around nine years. So we've already seen on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, big sections, big sections of the Great Barrier Reef have had two or three, two or three um, marine heat waves and coral bleaching events you know, within four years. So, so globally, all the analysis shows once you once you cross around 1.5 degrees of global warming these marine heat wave events are happening far, far, far more frequently everywhere um, in the tropics uh, than, than what a coral reef can potentially, can potentially recover. So the, so that the projections are once we get above 1.5 degrees, some, it, it, up to 95% of, of shallow warm water coral reefs, by shallow we mean within the first two, three metres, uh, are going to be severely severely degraded and and that's a pretty hard that's a pretty hard threshold so it's a, it's a very very serious um, situation so the so but some marine scientists think that even the amount of warming we've currently got there's been a sufficient increase in the frequency of marine heat waves and coral bleaching events that that, that threshold might already be be here so it's it's a very serious situation, and it will be one of the most you know immediate near term impacts of crossing one point five degrees will be will be very will will be on what are called shallow warm water coral reefs, including the fringing coral reefs, which are such a vital part of the livelihoods of many people in the Pacific. Thank you, thank you, Brendan. Um, the next question is to Kavita. Um, the audience is wondering about some actions that would increase awareness of climate injustice in the Pacific. What, what do you urge us to do? Gosh, it's about where do we start? Well, I think the first, the first one would be, you know, to really speak about it. I think, I think those of us working in different spaces, you know, whether it's in development or, um, or science, um, policymakers, civil society, we really need to start integrating, you know, a timeline of climate oppression and, and really educating and informing the, the, the people about what the systems that are behind the injustices, the same root causes of um, neoliberalism and um, patriarchy and militarism. These are, these are, you know, infrastructures that are using so much finances and resources and also behind causing the climate crisis. So one of, you know, the, one of the main things is, is, is really start going into spaces because the challenge is not to have this conversation among those of us who already know about these issues, but to really you know, educate and inform and change the mindset and attitudes of those who aren't able to relate how climate justice is not just an issue about climate science or climate change, but human rights. Um, 
people, you know, we need to shift power back to the people. People need to organize, mobilize, and infiltrate at all levels of governance to be able to counter misinformation um, and strengthen our, um, our fight against uh, the climate crisis. Um, so one of the things is to really learn about existing climate movements, you know, our journalists need to be informed about how to write on climate injustice and what actions and what solutions um, are just solutions, not green capitalism or techno fixes. Um, you know, and, and I think in the Pacific, a number of government agencies are working with civil society in reporting, you know, to whether it's under the UNFCCC, other international human rights mechanisms, the SDGs. This is a space where you do hold your governments accountable. Um, and so a lot more work needs to be done in terms of amplifying the voices that Jenny talked about, you know, these women who are actually doing the work and, and facing the brunt of this impact in these spaces. So these are some of the ones that I can think of. Thanks, Susan. It's a very good place to start. And we, we all have power in this conversation. Um, we all have our own networks to influence. So the next question is for you, Nicola. And it's a, 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 an interesting one. It's The question is, what would it mean if we don't reach 1.5 degrees? Oh, thank you. Um, look, that, that's a potentially a, a huge question, um, but allow me to make just a couple of points about it. I think uh, Brendan spoke to some of the, the main impacts that we're going to see at 1.5. Um, and you know, we talk about in the report about the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Um, overall, it's a, you know, the, the impacts that we are already seeing and the ones that we know will happen with 1.4 or 1.5 degrees simply get worse and worse as we move to 2.0. So the extreme weather that we talk about, the, the, the droughts in some places, flooding in others, increasing salinity of the soil and, and sea level rise when it comes to impacting Pacific Island states, these impacts will accelerate. Um, so in a sense, we don't really want to think about what it would look like. We know what it may look like, but we need to do everything we can to prevent that reality from taking place. Um, and we know that we know what the solutions are. We know what we need to do in order to make that, uh, well, to prevent that um, level of warming from happening. But the other thing that I want to emphasize here is that sometimes when we talk about um, you know, global warming or when the IPCC talks about it or you, know, you read about it in the media, you hear numbers like 1.5 or we're 1.1 or 1.2 now, then the goals are 1.5 or two. That's not the case. 1.5 is bad, two degrees is much worse, but 1.51 is not as bad as 1.52, which is not as bad as 1.53. Every fraction of a degree is hundreds or thousands of people's homes that are not underwater, uh, that, 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 as in that every fraction of a degree we prevent is many people, you know, people's homes that aren't underwater, crops that don't fail. It's ultimately, uh, people's lives that are saved or made much better. So this idea that, oh, well, if we miss 1.5, I guess two's the next threshold that seems to have crept into a lot of the discourse, I think is very unhelpful. Every fraction of a degree makes a big difference. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, we should all remember. Yeah, thank you. It's not as if the, you know, the current situation is livable for most people around the world. Um, Excellent. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Brendan. We have a question about what is meant by a nature-based solution and an ecosystem-based adaptation. So I guess this is picking up from what Kavita was saying about, you know, um, we want to avoid securitization and techno fixes and green capitalism. What's the alternative? Yes, yeah, thanks. So it's important to be specific here. There, there is no nature-based solution to stopping and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, okay? There's only one solution, and that's you either don't use fossil fuel as a source of energy, or you don't, use en you don't have energy, <laughs> or you use clean energy, right? So there is no um, solution. Some people are proposing nature-based solutions to offset fossil fuel emissions, by, by planting trees um, uh, and, 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 and through forest growth. And 
And I would argue that scientifically that's not valid. Um, of course, if there's somewhere where there isn't a forest and you're planting, I mean, the, 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 uh, okay, let me start again, because I'm trying to be very precise. So there's no, there's, there's no nature-based solution to, to the fossil fuel problem. We just have to stop using fossil fuel and start using clean renewable energy, right? Which is which is going to be largely solar and and wind and and battery various kinds of battery storage systems. About ten to fifteen percent of global human emissions are from land and forest, and about 10, 12 percent are from deforestation degradation. So one nature one part of the one when we one nature based solution is to stop deforestation and degradation. Right? not as an offset to fossil fuel emissions, just because it's another source of human emissions. Secondly, uh, about two thirds of the forest which is left has been severely logged, commercially logged and degraded. Most of the biomass carbon in a forest is in big old trees. So when you log a forest, you take out most of the carbon, which means a lot of our natural forest is below its natural carbon core storing capacity. So again, if we stop logging and degrading our natural forests, the ones that have been degraded, they can regrow and they will remove a lot of CO, a lot of atmospheric carbon dioxide. It won't be offsetting the fossil fuel emissions, if you like, it will be refilling the, the, the depleted stocks from the prior land use. So when it comes to mitigation, nature-based solutions means avoiding ongoing deforestation and degradation. A nature-based solution also means allowing a degraded forest to restore some of its de depleted carbon stock. But that's not offsetting fossil fuel emissions, right? It's just, it's just preventing an additional source of carb CO2 emissions and, and doing some restoration of previous depleted forest carbon stocks. We also can talk about nature-based solutions when it comes to helping us uh, deal with some of the impacts and risks from, from climate-related hazards. So nature-based solutions when it comes to ad you know, adaptation and risk management. And again, coral reefs are a very good example. A live coral reef absorbs wave energy and is a natural uh, coastal defence against um, inundation. Uh, a dead coral reef quickly breaks down and loses that defensive function. Same with mangroves, where you have a, a, a coastal geomorphology that naturally supports mangroves and you've cleared the mangroves, regrowing the ma mangroves provides a natural defence against certain coastal hazards. So we can talk about nature-based solutions in the mitigation space, but not in terms of offsetting fossil fuel emissions. It's a, it's a, it's, a, if, if you like, another source of emissions that we can manage. And we can also talk about nature-based solutions in the adaptation solution space when it comes to the, if you like, the ecosystem service benefits we can get from, from, um, from healthy, healthy ecosystems. And, of course, if we're interested in, in adaptation for uh, the voiceless and, and wildlife and biodiversity rich large, and obviously... The best nature-based solution from them is a is a healthy is a healthy habitat and ecosystem. Yeah, that's right. I was just thinking, uh, as you said, uh, it's about human rights, but it's also about the rights of nature and biodiversity, as many of the people in our chat have been discussing. May I just say, shout out to Cheryl signing that response, <laughs> Brendan. That was extraordinary, um, amazing work, Cheryl. Some complicated stuff going down there. And uh, we're about to hit you again with a very complicated question to Kavita about climate finance. Oh, we've got Karen for this. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. So this, this question is, is so crucial to this whole debate, which is who should pay? You know, who pays? Who, who is ultimately um, undoing the system, right? And we're getting a lot of comments in the chat about democratic accountability in this discussion. So the question specifically is how do we ensure that finances can be made available to address loss and damage 
as well as climate adaptation and resilience in the Pacific region. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to just throw some figures here just just to illustrate what wealth inequality looks like in our world. There is no shortage of money. We've got enough money to solve this climate crisis nine times over. The problem is where is that money? Who holds it and what's it being used for? So, you know, the net worth of American billionaires grew by 15% to $3.38 trillion during COVID last year. Global military expenditure which was around a thousand of uh, almost 2000 billion in 2019 grew another 3.6% last year tax havens are estimated to hide 36 trillion in cash gold and securities and this is excluding the net worth of real estate art and jewel so this is this is how money on the one hand is being used by governments and on the other hand how the rich are avoiding you know disclosing the wealth that they have and together you can see that you know even though we've got institutions like the green climate fund or the gef or the adaptation fund and numerous cli financial climate institutions all scrambling to find the money to finance climate adaptation and resilience so again we really need to look at how money is being distributed or held or hidden in, in the current neoliberal economic model and systems that actually protects the elites from being accountable. So the problem, you know, and, and, and we have to talk about aid here as well. So a number of countries, particularly the rich nations always talk about, oh, but we give so much money in aid. They do, they do. But up to two trillion, two trillion flows from poor countries back to developing countries because of trade mispricing, debt servicing, illicit financial flows and unfair trade rules. And this is why I really brought up this thing about the unjust international trade and investment regime, because this is the reality of how poorer nations governments are strapped from doing what needs to be done. You know, whether it's to protect um, the climate or to protect women's and children's right or excess equal education. This is, this is a key problem within the system because the money is just so unfairly distributed. Um, and so, you know, and then the reality is, you know, we've had up to 25 million people being displaced last year from the climate crisis. And now we're, you know, none, all of us watch the news and we can see that disasters are occurring at the rate of one or two a week, which is going to cost something around 300 billion per year going forward. We haven't even amassed a hundred billion in the GCF, which was what was committed. We've got 10 billion there and that took a good five years. Um, and so, you know, it is really about how do we then dismantle the current systems that keeps enriching the wealthy and marketing things as great scientific achievements where, you know, you've got two extremely rich men who just go and touch space and drop back to earth because it's cool, you know, and they can't pay living wages um, to their employees. There is something fundamentally wrong with this system. And so we really need to tax the rich. We really need to cancel debt for poor countries. We have to overhaul this unjust trade and investment regime. You know, we have to really cut back on military spending and Australia is notorious for this as well. The amount of money that goes into the military infrastructure when it could be spent on climate resilience and adaptation even within the country is shocking. Um, and then, so, you know, and, and the main thing for us in the Pacific is to really lobby our government to make sure that they hold the red line and get rich countries to commit the finances that they owe us, not just 
through the GCF and the commitments, but their overseas development aid, which, you know, they've been, you know, this is something that's quite separate to climate finance, but equally important for us in the Pacific to develop, it's ODA. And out of 30 countries, only five have paid ODA in the last two, three years. This is a problem. Um, and yet we are still, you know, paying off these trade agreements and, and through debt and, and all these other, um, systems that keep draining us and, and, and making it completely impossible to tackle the climate crisis without having the finance technology and resources to do anything else. Thank you, Kavita. A lot of people are saying in the chat um, that COVID is, um, I guess, a, a dress rehearsal, um, both in terms of the attitudes to science, but also it has it's exposed so much these inequalities in between societies, in societies and between nations. So can we see around the way vaccines, for example, are distributed, we can see some of these problems that you're talking about with the system. <laughs> more more uh, a comment, but it's just coming through in the chat very much that people are thinking about the way COVID is uh, maybe uh, Sorry, Susan, did you, did you ask, ask that to me? And yeah, so and, just, yeah and okay. Just, yeah. yeah, so look, I mean, the way countries have mobilized finances at the scale and at the speed to tackle the COVID really shows that they could have done the same for climate. But they didn't because there is simply not the political willpower to address climate change. Because again, climate change is being phased you know, the, the worst impacts of climate change is being faced in the global south. And frankly, they don't care. It comes down simply to that. Those of us that, you know, um, engage in international spaces, whether it's the UN or COP or anywhere in New York and Geneva, we're constantly trying to fight to amplify the voices from the global south. But the narrative is dominated entirely by rich nations holding the power and the privilege and protecting their power and privilege. So even now, like if you look at what's happening with the vaccine, right, they've hoarded vaccines so that the global south cannot access it. It is exactly the same thing that they're doing with their climate agenda. And this is why fundamental is that the root causes of our multiple colliding crises, our debt crisis, our climate crisis, our COVID crisis, the root problems comes down to the same racist, white supremacist, colonial, patriarchal systems of power and wealth. Um, and, you know, neoliberalism and just calling it out capitalism as is, because this, this is what is really creating and perpetuating increasing inequality discrimination um, and for Pacific Islanders, this is huge because, you know, these people are not only losing the little land that they have, but even their ocean resources, even their, um, you know, the very air that they breathe, their access to fresh water, food insecurity, like these are just, these impacts are compounding and colliding. And it's, and it's terrifying for those of us to, who are working in this space to, to just feel this intense despair that it's been 20 years of negotiations and we are still mired in the semantics of language rather than implementation and action, which really comes down to putting down the money to make it happen and change. Um, you know, the things that are just simply not working for us. So whether it's climate action or equitable distribution of the vaccines, it's, you know, one and the same problem with the system. Thank you so much. That's very useful. And now I wanted to go to Jenny to think about some of these ideas in the context of the, the women on the front lines that we were discussing. I really enjoyed what you were saying about the climate litigation and the, the try to structural changes at the UN trying to increase the intersection of human rights and climate change. I just wondered if you had some more um, insights into what we've learned from the report process about what we should be focusing on and where we should be putting our energy. And just so everyone knows, we'll also be coming to Jenny for the, the final comments as well. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really uh, important thing to think about. And I think a lot of that comes from the narrative that we're focusing on. 
um, and ensuring that when you're talking about climate, you're taking into account those who are experiencing these impacts, the vulnerable and marginalized communities that are being hit the first and the worst. Um, and making sure that you're amplifying those voices in, in the spaces that you're going to. So I think leadership needs to come from those who are most responsible and in holding those leaders to account and in pushing the climate action that we need, um, we need to amplify voices and stories from these communities and from the Pacific. And I think that, that that's, it must be, it must be a two, two way street and, and that discussion that takes into account all the people uh, who will be going through this because it's the Pacific first, um, but it's not just gonna be the Pacific. The, this is gonna impact everybody uh, and is already impacting millions around the world. And so we need to put up a concerted effort uh, and concerted fight in ensuring that there is a sustainable future for all because that that is what people deserve. Thank you. Spoken like a true leader. Uh, we're going to come back to you in just one second because we're coming to the end of our question time. Um, but I just wanted to ask Nicola one last time if he had any closing comments before we do that. I suppose what I'd like to emphasize is, I mean, again, to, to have a look at the way that this issue is spoken about in the media and elsewhere. And often we see, and it's something that at Greenpeace, we really have, are very careful to try and avoid. We often see climate change and its impacts described in the passive voice as things that are happening, but they're just sort of happening to people. It's a, almost a natural phenomenon that is taking place and different communities try to cope with it in different ways and maybe we can try and prevent it, but it's, it's sort of just kind of out there. Um, but the reality is that this is something that is being done to us and it's being done to the most vulnerable people in the world by people uh, and, and companies and, and nations who all have names and places where they live and work that they do. Um, and it's really the extent to which the power of those people who are, who are inflicting the climate crisis on everybody else can be um, counted by other sources of power, including many of, of, that, we've already, that we've canvassed on this call previously, that is going to determine whether we meet the challenge of this climate crisis or whether we allow warming to get to catastrophic levels. Um, ultimately, th th that's what we're talking about here. And of course, the science is the first crucial step, understanding the science and the targets that it demands of us. But the next potential, I mean, I would say more difficult step is figuring out the levers of power and how to shift them so that we can get the changes that we need. Thank you. And that, that brings a lot of the issues here together. We want to be able to take action. We want that action to be based on good science and, and good understanding but we want that action to be rights-based and structural. We want that action to be community first focused and to understand deep intersectional inequality within communities and between communities. So that's what we've heard here today. And it's a really brilliant lesson to keep listening to, especially as we start thinking about the, uh, uh, the global debate about the latest IPCC report. And we're watching the world as they come together in Glasgow. So I'm coming back to you, Jenny, as one of our youth advocates. You should always have the last word, I think, um, to, uh, to lead us to the close. Thank you. This is a pivotal time for climate action. And climate change isn't stopped during this global pandemic. And it's crucial for those who are responsible to show leadership. It is not too late for the Pacific to recover in the face of these crises and to prosper for generations to come. For this vision to move from ambition to reality requires first recognizing the uniquely critical danger that Pacific Island countries find themselves in. It requires acknowledging that global emissions are unjustly shared with the Pacific people being the least responsible for the current crisis and especially compared to the world's biggest 15 emitters. 
It demands that the world's biggest polluters therefore accept that they bear the greatest responsibility to change course and agree to rapidly reduce their greenhouse gas emissions through increased commitments backed by concrete policies to achieve them. It means those responsible provide finance for loss and damage already being faced by vulnerable communities. There is cause for optimism and hope. The Pacific can survive and thrive and it will take concerted effort and leadership. The commitment, power, and resilience of Pacific climate movements, including the work by the Pacific climate warriors, Pacific Island students fighting for climate change, the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, and a number of social and feminist movements, including unions that have joined the youth leading the fight for climate justice, gives hope and courage for this fight. The world cannot return to business as usual. We must work towards a just recovery that is people-centered, context-sensitive, and truly leaves no one behind. This means that we must put people first in our responses, provide support to communities in building resilience and solidarity, and change our systems to comprehensively respond to impacts faced by vulnerable and marginalized groups. There is so much to fight for. And connected by the ocean, we're all working to preserve our homes, cultural heritage and history for ourselves and for those who will come after us. Truly, we are not drowning, we are fighting. Do your part, download and read the report, sign the petition, support local youth groups, amplify Pacific voices and continue to hold your leaders to account. A better world is not just possible, it is fundamental, it is necessary. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, that brings us to the end of the seminar. Very grateful for everyone who has attended. Deeply grateful to our Auslan interpreters. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Karen. Um, and to our amazing speakers, all strength to your arm. Uh, now, it just, uh, just listen to Jenny and we go out in the world. We do our thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations. Farewell. Okay,